Saints. I hope you'll stay with me a little while. I know it's a very disadvantage to start this late on a message. But I'll do my best to condense it as much as I can and still try to get to you what the Lord would have you to hear. Book of Jude, verses 11, beginning at verse 11 through verse 13. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, and have ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward, perished in the gainsay of Korah. These are spots in your feet charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit wither, without fruit twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. You may be seen. Mark. I would like to say a lot of things about conference, but we don't have time for that. Got a message. I would like for you to know these chilling words. I never read them, but they don't bring chills to me. When the fellow wrote this, he was divinely inspired. Have you ever heard words like this before? Raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame. That's, man, that does something. And then when he gets to this point, wandering stars. To whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. That's the ultimate of fear and dread and sadness and sorrow and disappointment to me to hear those words. I don't know of a judge that ever gave a burden that would have brought more sadness to a courtroom than this writer has brought to us tonight. Let me say at the very beginning of this message, please remember it not only tonight, but try to remember it the rest of your life, that you are right now writing yourself the evidence by which you will be judged. You yourself are writing the evidence that will try, and your judgment will be given by your own evidence. Recently you read yourself, no doubt, of Apollo 13, got in trouble, stranded 200,000 miles from the earth. I don't even like to... Uh, listen to the radio when these fellows fire off in those rockets. I've got a serious case of claustrophobia, and I get to thinking about them fellows cramped up in those little machines, and I have to stay there for two or three weeks, and that just smothers me. And then when they said they're in trouble and may not get back, I just nearly had a fit. I think I prayed for them, if I remember right, because I know how it ain't to be stranded 200,000 miles from the earth in a little old bitty capsule. Swim, march in the water and fuel and oxygen. Trusting a, what they call a lunar module that was not even supposed to correct the course of travel between here and the moon. It was supposed to do 
what they wanted it on the surface of the moon or in the moon's atmosphere. They didn't know if it worked or not. It was not even designed to do what they were fixing to have to do with it. Now here is the serious point of these fellows traveling. Don't forget that there's a slim margin now of oxygen. Supplies just a limited amount, water, fuel. A small instrument that was not prepared, not designed to correct their course is what they've got to depend on to bring them back to Earth. And mind you, when this happened, when they started back toward our Earth, they were on a path that if it was not corrected, would cause them to miss the Earth. And who knows? God only knows where they would have gone. They would still be traveling. At what speed, I don't know. They were traveling somewhere around I think, what, 28,000 miles an hour, something like that? Well, you can imagine if they would have missed the earth and went on back out where there is no gravity pull and constantly the momentum building up. God only knows to what galaxy they would have wound up. And of course, the faster they go, and the, as the days pass and the nights pass, would meant that they were constantly getting further and further from the earth, if they would have missed. And it's all depending on this one little module, this thrust of a machine that was not designed at all. We hope it'll work. The world was in uh, anxiety at that moment. And I'll just be honest with you. I don't understand how they held together in their thinking. Me with the Holy Ghost. I, I don't mean this to be humorous because my message is not humorous at all. But I get on a plane. I, I just try to check my Holy Ghost out just as clear as I know how. And I want to be sure I'm ready to meet God. And I try to tell myself every promise in the book is mine. And uh, I like flying, but I, I also have some anxiety about it. And here while I'm back, I sit on a plane comforting my heart that I was just as much a child of God as Paul was, and I had to think that Paul said he was shipwrecked. <laughs> the wrong scripture for me to think of right then. How serious this was. It had to be split-second timing. It had to be sufficient thrust. Or those boys would have just said goodbye, world, goodbye. And that had been it. Now, I don't want to brag on, I'm not trying to appear to be so spiritual, but I was so burdened last night after the service, I asked permission from Brother Duke Cabinet. I could come here to the church and pray and see God and somewhere around two o'clock the Lord began to deal with me about this message. I feel like somebody's here tonight. Usually I don't know ahead of time what I'm going to preach. But I feel like somebody is in this audience tonight that surely must need it. It is a message I feel. I would like for you to know what is said in Jews about these wandering stars. This is what would have happened to the astronauts. They would have become helpless wandering stars. If the course of their travel had not been corrected in time and sufficiently, they would have become wandering stars. They would have missed their mark. The carrier Iwo Jima that was waiting for them at a certain spot would have had to pull back into port without their cargo. 
Those boys would have been still traveling, wandering, wandering, no telling where. God only knows. Notice the three conditions that produce what we have read. If you fall tonight, listen carefully to me now, if you fall, you will fall by reason of one of these errors. And these three men's names are mentioned to represent total error in their capacity, their field. Cain, Balaam, and Korah. If you want to know the facts, these three men's names represent the entirety of failings. If you fall, you will fall by one of their mistakes. By what they represent. Cain, Balaam, and Korah. Flesh, world, devil. Cain represents everything that you and I fight in the flesh. Balaam represents everything we will fight and resist in this world. And Korah personifies Satan and his original proud sin of rebellion. And if you fall, you will fall through one of these channels, at least. You could possibly fall by all three. But you will go down under the blows of one of these errors. I sincerely pray that you'll consider it tonight. Every one of us needs to think a little more soberly. We're on a course and we're traveling fast. Here's what scares me. Now let me take you back to these boys in this spaceship. You have to understand that split second time they had to make that correction. Or it would have done no good. If they would have gotten within, oh, say, uh, even a uh, hundred miles of the Earth's surface, and said, boy, we better, we better spy this thing. We better start something up around here. They might as well forget it. Somewhere out there, there's the uh, Earth's gravity. It's, uh, it's a band around this world. I don't know, understand all I know about it, but... Uh, they tell me that those boys hit that at the wrong angle and it's just like throwing a rock on water. They'll just bounce and, and uh, splash off into time and eternity. The timing and the power of this bus determines whether or not they make it. Dear God, I wish I had the power to preach what I see tonight. In the book of Romans, chapter 2, we find two classes of people. Brother Covenant, would you mind getting that for me? Romans 2, and beginning at verse 2, and read through verse 11. I'd rather the Bible do the talking anyhow tonight. We have two classes of people, and if you'll listen carefully to the reading of the Word, you'll find there is some seeking, and there is some contention. There is two classes of people mentioned in this book. They are seeking, and others are contention. One is active in his perseverance. The other simply is quarreling with his love. He does not want to come under the yoke of truth. Therefore, he becomes the slave of unrighteousness. Would you kindly read it, Elder Cavanagh? We are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou, says poor man, that judges them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God. 
Or it spoils the sons of riches on his goodness and forbear and long suffering. Not knowing the goodness of God leadeth thee to repent. But after thy heart and his best heart, praise yourself. For to thyself laugh against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. The man who by affection continues in well-doing, seek for glory and honor, and immortality, eternal life. But of the things that are content, and do not obey the truth, but do but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation, and anger, upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first, and also of the Gentiles. But go on and speak to every man that worketh good, to the Jew first, and also the Gentiles. For there is no respect of persons with God. If God is talking tonight through me, if he is, and I feel that he is, here is simply what it means. Somebody is fast getting off course. And the thing is, we're traveling so fast, and it's such an important journey, that split-second timing determines if you correct your course. I beg you, in the name of God Almighty, to look back a few years and see where you started from. And what was delivered to you in the form of a message? And will you honestly and sincerely route your course from that point to where that preacher that preached to you pointed to another world? And see if your fast traveling has still got you on the same course. The book of Jude is not to a bunch of renegades only in the time it was written. Did you know, friend, we are living in the day that it seems like. Now I can remember, I've had the Holy Ghost, I believe, 27 years, if I make no mistake. It seems to me that uh, a few years back, you could pray through of the morning and get a good blessing. And then uh, that seemed to last for two or three days. I mean, you could feel the effects of it. But you can pray through this morning, and by noon, you wonder if you even pray. And you just well face it, we are in darkness. I mean, our ship is floating in total darkness. And I hope there's a communication between this spaceship and some control tower somewhere. And there are computers, and what in the world, the message coming through to us. Boy, it's time to correct the course. How long has it been since you prayed until you knew your prayer went through? How long has it been since you loved the kind of love you know God accepts? Well, I thank you. Well, this is too serious. It's no free astronaut fixing to miss the earth and going into outer space and becoming a part of some galaxy somewhere. This is souls that are eternity bound. Every one of us should be guarding our experience with care. You have to forgive me tonight, but this is a burden that's eating me up, and I don't know if I'm even preaching or not. I feel more like just crying than anything else. Oh, God. 
Brother X. B. Morgan, I love that man. Him and I was talking one time in Miami, preaching for him. And I guess the first time that this thought was provoked to me, not this exact message, but the thought of reconsidering things. I hope Brother Morgan doesn't mind me saying this. He was talking to me one day, he said, Brother Bean, said I got to play it the other day, and that I got to thinking, now God, is there anything that I started out preaching that I'm not preaching now? And said the Holy Ghost spoke to him and said, how long has it been since you preached the message on divine healing? He got to thinking it's been over a year or better. So he just took the simple old message of James 5 and began to preach it. There's any sick among you, let him call the elders of the church. Praise God. While he was preaching, a knot faded off of someone's neck and a finger was straightened out and several healings was performed. God's honor to him bringing his ship back on course. Here's what scatters the life out of me tonight is a lot of these thoughts and messages are considered unimportant on our course. But any morning will tell you that one degree off right now doesn't seem like much. But a few miles out yonder, friend, it's serious trouble. How could it be said of a child of God that he became a spot in a feast of charity? How under the heavens could it ever be declared that a preacher, saint, could be called a cloud without water? How could it be a well without any water? A cloud carried about as a tempest. A tree that's withered and no fruit on it. And then to cap it off just to say, okay, wandering star. Just wandering. Lost. So far off course, they're just wandering now. They have no goals. They have no real motive. They are just wandering stuff. To whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Because it's somewhere. Maybe at a person in Indianapolis. Maybe in a midweek prayer service. Friend, Jesus Christ does not always pick a spectacular occasion to warn you. I'll be honest with you. I have had better men give me serious warnings that saved me. I've had center men walk up to me and tell me things. I'm talking about my experience. They said I couldn't teach me nothing. Will they have me? I'm not saying that he has God and he is saved, but the old boy knew about God. He was backslid. One of them walked up to me one time and said, Look, God, I want to say this. If you plan to live for God and preach the gospel, so and so and so. And I hadn't thought of that. But see, he had done been gone. He knew what caused him to fail. It wasn't always a spectacular occasion that Jesus turned to Judas. Judas, son, you're fixing to lose your Lord. Yeah, this could have been sold, and this is a waste. And Jesus said, yeah, the poor you've got always, but I'm going to tell you, Judas, you don't always have me. You're fixing to lose me. He had numbers of altar calls before he ever walked out of that meeting that night and betrayed his Lord. My God! But here in Roman 
tongues. He said, Thou art just continually. They just will do it. It's an active perseverance of their experience. They are forever reaching for something that will secure them in God. Then there are those who are always contentious. Somebody comes along and preaches something they need to do. And because it doesn't fit their fancy, they say, I don't want that, don't have to take it. And immediately begin to try to find something all over the man that preached it. Most of it went down the sides of his jaw. 
and just kept this going until finally he got a taste of it. And another little taste, another little taste. First thing you know, he was walking around nudging us for some more. There's such a thing as getting to starve spiritually so you can come in a service and worship is detectable. Don't bother me with that. I, I'm too starved to even want it. They tell me a man just before he freezes to death suddenly feels warm. My wife's grandfather was traveling, doing a little hoboing around, and he's riding a freight train one night, freezing weather. His buddy had been a little more experienced at it than he was, and he looked over at old dad Kilgore, and he said, how you doing, Kilgore? He said, you know, all of a sudden I just got real warm. And the train was moving, and he just knocked him off the train, jumped off with him, and built up a fire. He said, man, that's the first time the freezing to death. It, you just feel a certain warmth. And you just, uh, man, you're in dangerous condition. And it's so terrible to look out as an audience and know that saints are dying. But they feel so cozy and so warm when really they are dying. They're dying. Wandering star, to whom is reserved the blackness and darkness forever, simply because the course wasn't changed in time. All right, in St. Mark, chapter 8, verses 17 and 18, I would like to show you the condition of a number of people in this audience tonight. And I'm going to do my best to try to talk to them. I don't know if I can or not. Read it, Elder, if you will. Oh, and when Jesus God. knew it, he said unto them, Why reason ye because you have no bread? Why reason ye? That's the number one mistake that you have ever made in your life is to stop and try to reason this thing out. If the devil can get you to reasoning on holiness, reasoning on faith, reasoning on consecration, comparing yourself with yourself, he's got you on your way out. All right? Because you have no bread. I need you not yet. Neither understand. Perceive ye not. Neither understand. Neither understand. Have you your heart yet hardened? You mean your heart becoming hardened, or is it? Have you eyes? See you not. And have you ears? Hear you not. And do not ye not remember. Let me just make a point here. The way to keep your faith, you better not reason. Now this is not my total message tonight, but I want to show you my point. If I stop tonight and start reasoning on faith, I'll lose my faith. Someone said to me, what's the difference in pulling a tooth and extracting a gallbladder? Technically there is none. But if I start that reasoning, I'll wind up with no faith. One asked me, what is the difference with washing with soap that kills small germs? It has a certain amount of disinfect and using a shot of penicillin to kill other germs. Technically, there is none. But if I go to reasoning that way, I'll lose every ounce of faith I ever had in my life. The number one danger, friend, is when you start reasoning and you compare your wedding band with anything else in the line of jewelry. You compare your holiness standards with somebody else's. You're fixing to run into some serious trouble. And God knows I didn't plan to preach on all of this, but I'm just trying to show you a point. One reason you 
Now, what happened when you started reasoning? You started losing your sense of balance. You are now drifting into a coma. Notice what it says. Perceive ye not? Do you not see? Can you not hear? Do you not remember? Is your heart yet hardened? And do you not understand? This to the young man in the hospital in Houston and in a car wreck. Known his family for years, all my life. I walked up to his bedside and his eyes were fastened in my direction. The nurse that was attending him at all times, she uh, shook him. That seemed to me like she handled him a little rough. She slapped his face. Called his name, said, uh, uh, Reverend Bean is here. Do you do you know Reverend Bean? Do you remember him? Can you see him? Hey, uh, Reverend Bean is here. Do you, do you see him? Answer me. Answer me. Can you hear him? Can you see him? You remember Reverend Bean? His eyes were fastened toward me, and he never moved. eyes was open. He had ears. His heart was still beating. But he was in a coma. He had no memory. He had no perception. He had no understanding. He could not see me. He could not hear me. dangerous time to try to change your course. Pastors, are you understanding what I'm saying, how dangerous that is to try to change the course of a saint when they've got that far along? Have you ever been to their bedside, I'm talking spiritually, have you ever stood there and say, don't you perceive, isn't there any perception at all to you? Have you no understanding of your condition? Hey, child of God, listen to me. I'm not desiring to, to shake you so severely. It's no pleasure to do that. I don't glory in being hard and harsh. It's no honor to me to be a hard hitter. But look, hey, do you, don't, you, don't you see me? Can't you hear me? Do you not understand? And one of the saddest things, do you not remember? I've gone to the house of a backslider, and here's how I check them to see where they are as far as returning to God. One of the first things I mention, do you ever get hungry to feel his presence again? If there is still life, something will break. The memory of times when they had no animosity, no enmity, no, no pride, no sin, they stood in the sanctuary with God's people and enjoyed that good warm fellowship and that sweet spirit that flowed like a river. Suddenly their memory goes back to that shouting prayer meeting they was in. Friend, if you can retain a memory, you have, I have hopes for you. If I could get some of you in this audience tonight to go back 15, 20 Maybe some, in the case of some, 30 years. 
to remember how little you were the night you now at that altar. And it didn't matter to you what the preacher said you were willing to do it. And what a sweet feeling there was in full surrender. Instead of that coming to church prepared to resist everything that's in. Coming to the house of God and you're here tonight as sure as there's a God in heaven that came here prepared not to be moved by anything. If you would have been if you'd have thought for a minute that you would have ever been touched in this service, you'd have never darkened the doors of this building. Can't you see? Don't you see? Is your eyes so blinded? Are you in such a spiritual coma that you don't see that others that have done the same thing will happen to them? Don't you hear anything? Doesn't the sound, not of my voice, but the sound of that sweet voice of conviction reaches? Did you hear something? Can't you hear a voice from the control tower saying it's time to change course? Tonight's the night to make the correction. You better stop your drifting. You're drifting too far off. Oh, Lord, God. If you bypass this point of correction, you'll miss it and become a wandering star that nobody can reach. That no sermon can in any way reach you. How in the world could Control Tower in Houston ever do anything for those boys that they'd have missed the earth? Finally, they'd have lost radio contact. Finally, they'd have been silenced in their capsule. Finally, they would have just passed the closed house and say, boys, we've lost all contact. I imagine frantically they'd have tried their best to get in touch with Earth again. But it wouldn't have been there. Too far gone into yonder space. Nobody can reach you now. Here's the problem. Until a person gets in a can in any way reach you, how in the world could control power in Houston ever do anything for those boys if they'd have missed the earth? Finally, they'd have lost radio contact. Finally, they'd have been silenced in their capsule. Finally, they would have just had to close house and say, boys, we've lost all contact. I imagine, frantically, they'd have tried their best to get in touch with Earth again, but it wouldn't have been there. Too far gone into yonder space. Nobody can reach you now. Here's the problem. Until a person gets in a condition so there, they don't feel the need. Then when they get there, they're almost too far gone to correct it. Wouldn't it be wonderful if the Holy Ghost could come through here like a cloud tonight? Take every heart that's got the least bit of bitterness, jealousy, strife, hatred, anything that might be there, and just breathe on it and bring that ship back and point it towards that goal of eternal life. Oh, God, what it is. A hundred from the service they had in South America. In Columbia, they had a meeting of preachers. And the Spirit of God started rolling through the air and here a preacher stood up and said, Brother, I've had it off my heart against you. Forgive me. The other one stood up and said, Look, I've been talking about you. I want you to forgive me. Before that was over, everything was crying and apologizing. And before it was over, a visible cloud settled and hung over the place. God only knows what had happened here tonight. If ever heart would be willing for this sweet Holy Ghost to make a correction in their course. Oh, the thing that's 
pierce me as a double standard. For even if it's wrong for one to do it, it's wrong for another. Oh, if I preach against stealing, I cannot commit adultery. If I preach against one sin, I've got to be mindful of my weaknesses. I have to learn at a very early age to be destroyed. You know, I don't know where I got it all. Brother Stanton, Brother Morgan, I've got a lot of teachers. My mother. But I've got it in my mind, if you had the Holy Ghost, it's perfect. And I don't have it. And I come with the greatest disappointment. I found out people didn't pray half as much as I was. And yet it looks like they're doing more for God now. I found that could tell tales that would have condemned me to the lowest hell. Boy, that shook me. And I had to come to this conclusion. I personally believe there is a basic holiness both inward and outward, that every man must have to be saved as a basic order. Beyond that point, there are personal convictions. There are men that can do things I can't do. Now, I don't mean by that that, that they can drop below the basic level. But there are things that their conscience will allow that might have that like to kill me. I like to not over it. That shook me till I wondered if anybody was right. And I finally concluded, the scripture kept coming back to me, consider yourself. Consider yourself. Why are you looking at them? Wondering about them, they're looking at you, wondering about you. There's weaknesses in your life they can't do. I can't reduce my conscience to theirs, but I have to learn to accept men with their weaknesses just like they were accepting me with mine. Or I have lost confidence in everybody. Oh, Brother Bean, this will never happen to me. Don't say it. Don't say what that. I'm visiting in the home of a man who had been taught by a preacher in this city. One God, Jesus' name, had been drilled into it. He told me that his pastor came to his home not long before I was there. Looked at him and called him by name and said, Why don't you get out of that one God? And he called it a name I wouldn't name before you tonight. The saint looked at his former pastor and said, You put it too deep in me when I came in. You yourself can't get it out of me now. The point is this. Doesn't make any difference how many of that size in Jesus' name. Somewhere his ship got off course. And he didn't correct it in time. And he wound up not even believing the message. This is a day of apostasy, friend. I mean, your mind can snap on you spiritually. I mean, I'm talking about maybe you could go on and write letters and know how to go downtown and shop. But your mind could snap on you and you would no longer see this book as you see it tonight. The Bible says they go ahead and contend for these things. And the first thing you know, they become slaves to their unrighteousness. Past feelings. Shake them, they can't see, they can't hear. Well, they could walk out of a service like this and laugh at you. Walk you. 
Hey, you'll have to get something more than that. Well, I say this, it's very possible you feel that way tonight, some of you. But all in the world I'm obligated to do from this little control tower is to warn you that your ship's off course. Oh, I love everything that's been taught me. I don't know how people could turn away from this lovely message. I look around and see men that has afforded me so much in courage and boldness to preach this message. I thank God for every one of them. But brethren, even in preaching the message, we can get off course. And our hearts become hard, and as Brother Burr preached the other day, and we die inside. And it won't matter if the Holy Ghost can't steer us back to humility. If I beg you, I beg you. A young man came to me last night that I don't even know that well. I just met him a couple of times. But somehow or another, some way, he's developed confidence in me, and I hope I never break it. And uh, I'm not trying to be a pastor. That's not, I wouldn't do that for nothing. In fact, if I steer him to anything, I steer him to his pastor. I've never enjoyed the life, the life, life, of somebody being a Beanite. Somebody told me, said, Brother Bean, down in such and such a church, you really got some Beanite. I said, that doesn't praise me. That a teacher that can't, evangelist that can't teach saints to love their church and pastor hasn't been very successful. But I thought that that young man came to me and said, Brother Bean, if you ever see me straight from the message or truth, would you come and talk to me? My God, it wouldn't be something that one of us You see, he's just starting. He's just starting. Wouldn't it be something if ever one of us could get that a little tonight? I wonder if you really could be corrected. If there would be any after effect. If somebody said, look, you're an error. Okay, I'll wait around until I find you an error and I'll correct you. Do you want to be saved or do you want to make a show out of this thing? What are your goals? What is the goal? We're in all the land somewhere safely. I want the carrier to pick me up. You hear me tonight? I'm ready to be corrected. I want my course corrected tonight. By the next conference, it may be too late. Wandering stars, stranded with a slim margin of fuel, oxygen, and water, the means of survival. And I'm talking to some now whose tanks are very low. You're breathing the last spiritual oxygen that you will breathe. You are drinking the last refreshing drinks of water that you'll have spiritually. And if you don't fire the thrust, you're on your way to join the thousands in that far-off galaxy of wandering stars. Beyond the reach of a preacher, beyond the reach of God. So hard and deceived. I went to preach for a man one time. Don't glory in these experiences. First time I preached for him, if I remember right, I'd never been there before. Just one night service. Spoke to the pulpit. The Holy Ghost spoke to me and said, There's a man here rebelling against his pastor. If you don't repent tonight, change his course. I'm going to destroy 
told the church about it, and there the whole church came to the pastor and repented with that one man. And mind you, he had been the most faithful man in the church for years. He had been so faithful that he taught his children to love that pastor so much that he himself could not get that love out of their hearts after he rebelled. Everybody but this man came. That was on a Sunday night. I said, mark it down, and I'm not afraid of any prophecy I've ever given. And I don't say that boasting. But I have to know it's God, or I won't say it. I've never played the game of psychology to scare. I'm afraid to do that. That's lying. If I say that somebody's going to be judged here tonight, and I didn't get that from God, I'm just using falsehoods to stir you. And if you're begotten by that, you won't last. But I said, mark it down. Somebody write it down. That verbal being said on such and such a night, there will be a judgment in this church if there is not repentance tonight. Mark it down. Write it down. The following Sunday, they buried him. He never repented. He never changed his course. He is now somewhere wandering. I don't know where people go after this. It's lost. Uh, that's got some opinions, but I'll not argue with you about that. But somewhere in the regions and confines of eternity, that wandering star that once knew where he was going lost and wouldn't correct it in time. And God judged him within one week and sent him on his way. I was so burdened last night, I don't know who, I don't understand it all. This is a strange message to preach in the conference. I wanted to preach about the condescension. I wanted to preach about the love. Well, you could just shout it at a time. But at least I'd like to send one more message from the control tower. Son and daughter, correct your course tonight. Please do. Don't fuss at your role in life anymore. Don't kick against the prick. Say, I want to be saved and I'm tired of this heart full of rebellion. Man, I'd like to feel the joy of surrender, and there's no feeling on earth like the feeling of full surrender. Shall we bow our heads? I was in a little town in Mississippi for one service. Some of the preachers that was here are it was there was here tonight. I don't mind telling you that that audience sat down on me that night, preachers and all. They wanted to hear a fellowship meeting sermon. Pentecostals can be the most selfish people in the world. God spoke to me and said, you can't preach nothing but this. And he gave me a final message to a man in that audience. I fought through all types of spirits that night of unconcern and unbelief to obey God. Don't go around it. I just say that I'm trying to mind the spirit as best I know how. Man walked out, wouldn't change his course, wouldn't correct it. I had no more than got home. A day or two, the pastor called me and asked me if I remembered such and such a man walking out. I said, I do. He said, we're burying him tomorrow. That sweet voice that knows how to penetrate all types of atmosphere reached his little receiving set and said, son, you better correct your course tonight. You're fixing to miss it all together. And as long as God lives, you will wonder as a star cast out, fall up. And he 
wouldn't measure. I don't know who I'm talking to tonight, but somebody's here. Holy God, I'm trying to obey you tonight. I wish conviction had come heavier. I wish there's more faith. I wish your spirit would not be so repelled from our midst by unbelief. Do something for us. I wish that self justification wouldn't send out such static tonight. That's not me he's talking to. That's not me. That's not me. I'm all right. Oh, I don't have to hear him. Friend, you better not send out that kind of static tonight. You better cut your little radio down tonight and turn up that receiving set and say talk to me God crush me walk on me like a giant but don't let me see Brother Shu was preaching last night about the value of God's handles I was on my way to California and I stopped by his place, took sick as a dog. I'll never forget it, laying in that little old trailer that night, I said, God, walk on me like a giant, put your cleats on and walk on me. Because I know you're trying to tell me something, and I sure want to hear it. And if this is the best way you can tell it to me, let's have it. Praise God. Until I was afflicted, I went astray. I was fixing to miss God and miss Him back. I wish I could pour out my heart like I feel it. Some folks build opinions of preachers and think, boy, he's, he don't care, he's just mean. But if you could understand the broken heart, that's what it does when we see another one splash against Earth's gravity and bounce out into space beyond our reach. Are you breathing a prayer tonight? I know it's late. I'm sorry about that, but I've tried to convince it as much as I know how. Backslider, sinner, rebellious saint, unconsecrated saint. And could I bow my head and cause the angels to bend low when I say this? Because God knows I wouldn't bring an acquisition against the ministry. But with a bowed head, could I humbly say, Preacher, let's search. Are you as tender? Do you care? Is the burden for souls there? Have you said things that you need to fix? You need to fix them just like saints do. Let's be saved. Let's have a revival from this conference. My God of repentance and humility and dedication. Returning to the message in every form. I feel impressed with the Holy Ghost to ask Charles Rodney Free to stand right now and pour his soul out to God for us. I'm in need of heaven today. Oh!